And I think we are up and running, God willing. Let me open up on my phone to double check. And we thank the good Lord, how long did it take for us to get this going? Uh, I have been very, very busy doing many other things. Thank the good Lord that I was finally able to get around to doing this session. Yes, we are live. Thank the good Lord. If you all have any issues with my microphone or anything, uh, let me know. I've been working on getting Zoom to run all night long. Thank the good Lord. Finally got it running. I got my tabs open in the top. Everything working fine. We're live. Yeah, we are live. Uh, this is not pre-recorded. I know a lot of people have been asking me, William, uh, the shows you've been doing with Gary, you've been debuting in your channel, are those live? They're not live. They're what I call premieres to where the shows I've done with Gary and his channel, I premiere them here and I communicate with everybody in the chat. Like my little gift to you, I communicate. If anybody has any questions, I field any questions. So um, <clears throat> for people that may be wondering, uh, the reason I'm uploading videos, I recognize Virgin Most Powerful Radio are taken down. They're no longer on YouTube. They don't have a wide platform anymore, which is unfortunate because they put great material out there. And my brother Gary's he's amazing, one of the best. So I'm trying to help uh, give them greater exposure now that they're off YouTube. So I'm going to be uploading all the material I do there, here, and participating with you all in the chat, God willing. Uh, yeah, we are up, we're up late, uh, but I got a lot, lot planned. We're going we're gonna to have fun tonight. Mike Winger, we dealt with him already when it came to purgatory. What a horrific video, garbage. Lord, forgive me. I don't, I'm not trying to be rude or ugly. Uh, I'm, and that does not reflect the character maybe of Mike Winger. I don't know him. I don't know the guy at all. I've heard he's... Uh, very hateful, hates early church fathers, hates Catholics, even though as every Protestant, they all say, I love Catholics. I don't know him personally. I haven't followed any of his stuff. In the one time where we did dialogue, where I tried to get a debate set up with him, and he declined to debate me, said he would not debate me. Um, he was friendly with me in that one time. So I don't know much about him other than that one experience, but I do know that people don't like four, five, seven hour videos. So um, we'll keep this down to hopefully about an hour and 15, an hour and a half to try to, but we're gonna have to go through. Uh, yeah, everybody, I will, uh, God will be getting a playlist soon. I have a lot, as you all may know, that, how do I share some? There we go. I have a lot that I, I do. I'm working on preparing for multiple debates, working on a new book, multiple books. Um, <clears throat> we're working on our volume two. God willing, soon that'll be out on, uh, on Mariology. So we have our volume one out. Uh, we'll hopefully have a volume two out, a uh, definitive guide in Mary, more Mariology, more new translations of early church fathers, and a book just dedicated to the perpetual virginity alone. I've done a lot of work in the perpetual virginity from the apostolic, from the Bible apostolic era onward to the early debates on that. It'll be like nothing you've ever seen before. God willing, pray for all these projects, debates, books, articles, shows. I, I'm, my schedule is jam-packed from morning to night. Thank the good Lord for it. No complaints. But why do I bring that up? I bring it up because uh, God willing, soon I'll have somebody help me out on my channel, upload videos for me, uh, prepare playlists and everything. Uh, pray for that. God willing, I have been in touch with my uh, dear brother, Prophet Google. I haven't had a chance to get back in touch with him. The guy's great because uh, I have been so busy, but very well, uh, hopefully very soon. Let's dive in, though. Let's dive in because Mike Winger does not like Catholicism. And yeah, we'll deal with much more. There are more videos Mike Winger has done. If they have not been dealt with yet, I'll deal with them. I don't know if anybody's dealt with this video yet. I have no clue. I didn't look it up and see if anybody had done it. I, as far as I'm aware, the only other person that has seriously engaged Mike Winger has been my uh, my brother, uh, Trent Warren. I think I might be wrong. And if I'm wrong, don't throw a tomato at me. I don't know because I have not looked them up on YouTube. I do not know. Have, has anybody done a video replying to this? I don't know. But if they have, kudos to them. I haven't seen it. We're going to deal with every argument he brings up step by step. And we're going to expose him. 
as <clears throat> being an individual that is uneducated when it comes to Catholicism. Not only that, he doesn't know the apostolic faith, doesn't know what the Bible has to say about Mary, fuzz his, his clear bias and really hatred for the apostolic faith really comes out very clearly. But let's dive in. Let's hear a little bit of what Mike Winger has to say. Sharing it with you as to what it might be or how that relates to Christ. I have careful protections, but here's how this happens, how typology is abused. That's what we're going to focus on today. In particular, we're going to talk about the Catholic Church because I think they're not someone I want to pick on. But when it comes to Mariology, that's the best example of abusing typology that I've ever seen is in the specific teachings about Mary. So we'll get into that today. Here's how it happens, right? Um, when your church or the group that you're involved with has teachings that everyone in your group accepts, but one day you ask, how do I find that in the Bible? And then you start looking and searching and you go, I, I can't find this in the Bible. I'm starting to worry that this teaching may not be biblical, may not be true. But you know, false use of typology rescues them by going into the text and saying, well, it's not clearly taught in scripture, but it's pictured there. And it's not that hard to find a picture of whatever you want and to then use it to reinforce what ends up being a false teaching and then lets your people think they're being biblical when they're not. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so I have three rules that I'm going to mention first. These are three rules I use when I'm trying to do typology or find Jesus in the Old Testament. And the first rule is this, and I mentioned it several times, so I know you already know it. It's no new theology. That's my first rule. It's like, I'm not coming up with any new teachings. There's no new theology. It's not like some new revelation that I'm getting when I look at a picture in the Old Testament. See, typology starts with theology and then... But there, even, even there, there's a clear problem with Mike Winger's theology because revelation doesn't cease until the death of the last apostle. Um, is there a new revelation occurring in the New Testament? No doubt. No doubt about it. Of course there is. Was it foreshadowed in the Old Testament? Or are there pictures or shadows of it in the Old Testament? No doubt. No doubt. And again, everything that we're going to cover tonight, or the massive majority of it, I don't want people to come back and say, William, uh, you know, there's a lot more to be said on this particular topic. I realize it. today our goal is not to cover every father that talked about Mary as a new ark or every father that talked about Mary as queen of heaven, those, are, those lists are quite voluminous. I've done various shows in them. In fact, I've done over 35 shows on Mariology alone. So that is, even, even if I might miss one or two fathers, because later on I look in the comments, I see people say, William, you forgot that father. Look, I'm not going to try and be exhaustive. We'll do what we need to do. It'll be concise and it'll be, the point will be to refute heresy <laughs> is bad arguments if anybody does want a deeper in-depth examination of mary as the new ark of the covenant we break down the greek we look at early church fathers including uh unique translations that have not been done in english before you can find it i know most of you already probably have our book on mary but uh if you don't want to get the actual hard copy you can find it kindle edition you can get it in kindle and it will be available very soon and audible already we already got the final confirmation that will be available very soon god willing and looks for something in the old testament that might reflect that theology in a picture form it starts with the new testament clear teachings and looks for old testament pictures we do not start with extra biblical teachings and then try to force that onto the text of scripture that would be by nature not part of the bible so one thing that uh, i do want to make very clear and that was a mission and, and I know I can go on and on about our book, as you all probably have heard, you've seen the interview we've done in EWTN, we've broken it down. And why do I bring our book up? Because we don't argue that Mariology is extra biblical. Rather, we argue, as the early church fathers did, that everything that we believe about Mary, you can find it either implicitly or explicitly in the Bible itself. So we don't argue that we take everything we believe about Mary or really anything from outside the Bible. The kernel of everything we believe is either implicit or it's full-blown explicit about Mary. Like Mary being full of grace in possession of that grace that all of us should have been in possession of before the fall. That original justice 
as St. Augustine and the early fathers would have called it, the Bible is very clear that Mary is in full possession of that. The Bible is very clear that Mary had taken a vow because the exact words are being quoted from the book of Judges. There's no doubt about that. Mary was a perpetual virgin. There's a number of things that are very clear. Mary is mother of God, Teotokos. Remember, the particular Greek words are used, Emmanuel, God with us. We're literally told that Mary is the God-bearer, so she's the mother of God. There are multiple things that are very clear about Mary that are brought out in the Bible. Don't believe that kind of garbage that, well, well, you know what? Um, in, within Catholicism, and you got to be clear, uh, Mike Winger, look, Mike Winger knows nothing about Orthodox. Nothing about Orthodox. Um, he probably doesn't even know that within Orthodoxy, there's various branches. That within the apostolic faith, you've got Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Syriac Orthodoxy, and you even have uh, the Assyrian Church of the East now, whose Christology is perfectly clear. Uh, you don't, he doesn't even know that. So rather, <clears throat> if you are Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, Syriac Orthodox, his attack is not only on Catholicism, it's on Orthodoxy as well. And I'm sure you know that. Mike Winger does. He doesn't know better. You can't blame him. He knows very, he's, he's very poorly catechized when it comes to Catholicism. Really, as clear as I can be. He doesn't know it well at all. So that, that would be the most important thing we have to point out. That's not part of the biblical revelation. See, Scripture is a completed revelation. Old to New Testament, this is a completed revelation. That's why Jude, in Jude 3, it says uh, that we're to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered, past tense, to the saints. And the faith is the things we believe. So I'm to contend or fight, not physically, but fight for the faith that was once for all delivered, past tense, to the saints. Like if, if it's not here, if it's not part of that ancient record, then it wasn't part of what was delivered. So don't try to force something into it. In 1 Timothy 1, 3, Paul tells Tim Again, nobody, want, nobody ever argues that anybody is creating something that was not part of the original faith. The problem with Mike Winger is Mike Winger takes a passage that talks about the faith once for all delivered and then interprets that as being, well, it has to have been delivered within the Bible alone. The problem with that, Mike Winger, is you're not going to find the teaching of Revelation ceasing at the death of the last apostle in the Bible, and you're not going to find the canon of Scripture in the Bible either. You're not going to find those in there. Those are divine tradition. Those you don't find in there. Even your mutilated canon, you don't find it in your Bible. You get it from the publishing house when you open up your Bible or in the back of the Bible, but you don't have it broken down within the Bible itself. So that is a bad argument, a really bad argument. Again, the faith once for all delivered to the apostles does not then equate or equal to Bible alone. Mike Winger is wrong, as usual. You know, I got to call it the way, I, the way that I see it. I've watched two videos in Mike Winger so far, and they've both been atrocious. I've got to be clear with you all. Look, maybe, look, I'm looking here. Um, Jesus in the book of Judges, how to find Christ in the Old Testament, who was the angel of the Lord. Are those other videos maybe good? I, you know, maybe, maybe they are. But what I have watched thus far from Mike Winger have been two videos on Catholicism, and they've both been atrocious. You know what my problem is? My problem is Mike Winger, to me now, is very similar to Dr. Michael Brown and, and Dr. James White, is in that when they present arguments attacking Catholicism and their terrible arguments, then I call into question anything else, any other video they've done. I wonder, well, if they're that bad when it comes to the Catholic faith, are they giving a fair shake to these other things that they're critiquing? And I really wonder, really, you've got to wonder that. If you go back and watch the atrocities that are in Dr. Michael Brown's videos attacking Catholicism, because they're really, they're, they're horrific, they're terrible. They're awful. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Not even elementary level does he know what he's talking about. And you find that in Mike Winger as well. Does that then in turn mean the other material they've done is pretty bad? It could be. I don't know. But it does make me wonder, 
can I trust your other material if they're not giving a fair shake to Catholicism if they've not bothered to do their homework? I don't doubt that Mike Winger is an intelligent guy. Look at the amount of videos he's racked up. He realizes he has a market in attacking Catholicism. He has a following. I don't doubt he's an intelligent man. But being intelligent and knowing your Bible, very different things. Timothy, that he charges Timothy that, he, that Timothy would go and charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So we don't argue that there's any different. We, we don't argue that we don't argue that there's different doctrine uh, that you can't find in the Bible. Uh, there's not much that he's going to say here. He's going to dig dig in the Sola Scriptura. I'm trying to follow a uh, on my phone. I'm following a list of arguments he does make. So we're going to hop on over to the seven minute twenty second mark. There's other doctrines about Mary that they teach, but you don't have to accept. But here's the four dogmas you have to accept. The first one is that Mary, it, the immaculate conception of Mary. And you might be thinking, oh, you mean the virgin birth? No, 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 no. This is not about Jesus. This is about Mary. The idea is that Mary was conceived and born with no sin. And Mary lived her whole life without sinning. That's the idea. She never sinned. She Now they'll, they'll say, oh, we're not saying that she doesn't need Jesus's grace because they'll say Jesus is, Jesus is the one who made her without sin. And they'll often say things like, well, if you could make your mother without sin, wouldn't you? Except that's not how we make theology, right? Like, we don't just go... Look, look, again, the problem that we encounter with Mike Winger, the arguments of fittingness, arguments that you would have found in, in the great Blessed Dun Scotus and in other great scholastics, great theologians, they're not dogma. They're not. They are fantastic theological speculations that are true. But... We don't arrive at the dogma of Mary as immaculately conceived by merely saying, well, he was fitting. No, we arrive there from the very truth of the Bible in the book of Genesis 3, where we read about Mary never being under the dominion of the devil. That enmity between the woman and the devil. That is where we arrive there. Not only that, we view Mary as that woman, that new ark of the new covenant, that new ark that is in full possession of that grace, that particular grace that the book of Ephesians talks about. Mary is already in full possession of that when the angel appears to her. Be very careful when you hear these poor arguments that are being put forth. Every dogma about Mary, every one of them, does point to Christ. All of them. All of them do. Mary, all, Mary's all immaculate nature is by the grace of Christ and only by the grace of Christ. So Mary, it can be properly said, did nothing to merit being immaculately conceived or immaculately created. It is all by the grace of Christ. So intrinsically, Mary is not sinless by her intrinsic nature from her own merits or by uh, having a nature akin to that of the divine nature. No, Mary has a sinless human nature because of grace. Her nature is sinless because of grace, because of Christ. And then if somebody says, well, William, where do you find that in the Bible? Just told you. If Genesis 3 is talking about an enmity between the devil and the woman, we know that woman would be Mary, ends up being Mary. The woman is the mother of the Messiah. And I look, I, 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 re, I got a few emails of people telling me, no, well, you know, it can't be Mary. It's talking about Eve. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Even, even ancient Judaism, there are forms of ancient Judaism that show that it would be the mother. Not all of them interpret it as Eve. How? And indeed, good luck finding an early father that does interpret that enmity as being with Eve. How? If right there in verse 14 and 15, you've got very different images. Indeed, the fathers recognized that what was being talked about, those that strong language in verse 14, 
and verse 69 did not apply to the prophecy that was messianic. Now, not only was it messianic, but it was Marian. It was a Mariological one as well. Why? Because the mother of the Messiah, the woman, who would it be? It would be Mary. And we find this becoming a reality when in Luke 1, the angel appears to Mary, greets her as Kairi Kekaritomene. She is already in full possession of original justice, of that grace that you find that root word in the Greek in, in, uh, in Ephesians 1. We'll look at that more later. We've put out an article of that, and God willing, we'll probably include that in our new book on Mariology that will come out. But every dogma about Mary is to point to Christ. That is the Immaculate Conception. What about the perpetual virginity of Mary? It proves the incredible gift of that virginity that will remained preserved in our Immaculate Mother that our Lord and Savior didn't need to violate any kind of virginity from his mother in his most holy birth. Shows that the woman who was predestined as a great blessed Dunscota spoke of. Indeed, as the Father has talked about that, a beautiful vow, Ambrose, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and on. It shows the amazing things our Lord has done for her. Remember, a proper Mariology entails a proper Christology, and a proper Christology means you have a proper Mariology. What about Mary as mother of God? <laughs> Essential title that was enshrined at the Council of Ephesus and beyond, but even before, it was utilized even before. You find it in the Subtum Presidium, clearly utilized there. Now, does the argument work? Well, you know, Mary as Teotokos, it's only talking about Christ. No, everything Mary has is because of the Son of God. We recognize that. Everything. But don't then in turn say, well, who cares about Mary? That title is about Christ alone. How? If it is referring to the fact that our Immaculate Mother bore God, the God-bearer. The title is very Mariological as well. Indeed, the great Saint Cyril who fought with blood and soul to make sure orthodoxy stood up and fought and survived, wrote amazing things about our Immaculate Mother, all the while defending the Mariological and Christological term of Mary as Theotokos. Very clear that we need to point that out. What about the Dormition? The fact that the privilege of, of our, our Immaculate Mother to be taking body and soul into heaven at the final, her final moments on this earth to be taken body and soul into heaven yet again shows the incredible might of our God, our Lord and Savior Christ, who took her body and soul into heaven. This is, was taught, this is alluded to clearly in the book of Revelation, clearly, clearly alluded to in the Old Testament as well, taught in the early church as well. Look at what St. Ephraim says. The beautiful language. Look at what uh, Jacob of Sirag, where he talked about that ancient church council, where he read the poem about Mary's bodily assumption into heaven. He's reading a poem, very poetic language, talking about it. That poem being read at a church council well before we ever arrive to Munificentissimus Deus, well before then. These are ancient beliefs, and I would rather cling to the early church and what they believed and what they taught, because they grabbed it directly from Holy Writ and directly from the divine deposit of faith. I'd rather cleave to them than to Mike Winger. Wouldn't you? And therefore, it's true theologically, like that's not how we do it. But Immaculate Conception, she was born and stayed throughout her life without sin. She never sinned. The second one is the perpetual virginity of Mary. We believe that Mary was a virgin at the conception of Jesus Christ, right? At the birth of Jesus Christ, she had never been with a man. But their belief is that she continued to be a virgin throughout her entire life. And um, therefore, the brothers and sisters, and that's a whole different video, a whole different topic, and I'm not going to get into that. But that's the belief, right? Therefore, those are cousins and not really relatives. And Joseph and Mary were never together. 
Um, they were together. They were not together in a sexual way, but they were married. And the church does not bind anyone to believe that they are cousins, despite the fact that Singenusen in the Greek, utilized in the Gospel of Mark, very well could lead you to believe that they were cousins, very, very likely, possible, possible, but they could have also been children of Joseph from a previous marriage. The church has not dogmatically defined either one. All that we know from the Bible is that we're not children of Mary. How do we know that? We're directly told they're not. We're told that they were relatives or cousins. They were singing We're told that in Mark. Again, I've brought it up a million times. We break it down very clearly in our book, very clearly. And we show that even Jerome had that reading so we didn't make that reading up saint jerome had that very reading as well so that's the perpetual virginity of mary and then number three the divine maternity of mary or the phrase mary is the mother of god that's the terminology used the terminology itself isn't so terrible actually because it's actually about jesus it's about who is jesus jesus is god in one sense as a non-catholic i could say mary's the mother of god isn't the sense that jesus is god but what they're saying is that she has a special role that continues as the as the divine mother. She's in a motherly role forever, and she intercedes for you, and you can pray to Mary, and she can go to Jesus being his mom, and she can still intercede. And we'll get into that in a second. So, well, <laughs> and and I've got to I've got to laugh for a moment here, because rather than actually looking at as to why we continue to view Mary as uh, the mother of God, uh, not a divine mother. She's not a divine mother. She's the mother of God, the mother of the person, Jesus Christ, not the mother of the humanity alone or the mother of the divinity alone. She's not the producer of the divinity, that's for sure. But she remains the mother of God because biblically we're taught that Christ bodily rose from the dead, and he is in heaven in a real physical body. That is Christian doctrine 101. That is resurrection 101, really. Um, and if we believe that Mary is in heaven, which I, I really be hard-pressed to find a Protestant that would deny that, uh, does her role of mother end? Does it then end? Even though Christ is risen, Christ lives, Christ is eternal king, eternal God, eternal son, and has a physical, real body, uh, does, does, is she no longer the mother now, even though she is in heaven? It, you know, you, you get to this point where you got to really wonder, what, what is Mike Winger working with here? We recognize the role of Mary as mother continues. We're told it directly in the Gospel of John. Directly when Christ presents Mary as the mother to John. We have that vision brought to us even in the book of Revelation. So Mary's maternal role is not only, well, you know, Christ is born and it ends there. I really wish Mike Winger would do a better job of putting forth better arguments. Because rather than tackling why we believe what we believe, Mike Winger just you know, scrolls over. It really doesn't matter. Who cares? You know, he realizes the kinds of arguments that are being utilized. He might not know the good ones because he doesn't really care to do the homework. But not even dealing with the major ones that are utilized? Shocking. Number four, the fourth one, the glorious assumption. And this is something you have to believe that Mary, either when she died or she never died, there's Catholics on both sides of that issue, but that she was bodily taken up into heaven. She didn't, you know, her tomb was found empty also along with Jesus's, right? So she was taken up into heaven. That's the belief about the assumption of Mary. Unbelievable, unbelievable. The kind of lies that come directly from his mouth. Nowhere in, Munif in Munificitissimus Deus, nowhere in any early father do any of them say that we are required to believe that they found Mary's tomb empty. 
Nowhere do they say, well, the tomb was open, it was found empty. Indeed, there are fathers that believe Mary reposed, expired on a bed, and was then taken body and soul into heaven. So the idea that we're teaching that Mary was put in a tomb, the tomb was open, and she was then, she then bodily, kind of making a mockery of it, kind of like, oh, well, look at the parallelism. She was put in a tomb like our Lord, and she rose like our Lord did. The idea of adding that particular theology, that to the dogma, the clear idea is that Mike Winger has an agenda. That agenda is to make a mockery of Catholicism. Because Mike Winger doesn't know a thing about any of these dogmas. Even the one that he'll tell you, I'll affirm Mary as Teotokos, as mother of God. Mike Winger doesn't. Look, I'd be willing to put money down that Mike Winger doesn't know proper Christology. I guarantee you. He doesn't know a thing about Ephesus or Chalcedon. I guarantee you he doesn't know Christology well. <clears throat> because with a proper Christology, you have a proper Mariology. And a proper Mariology, you have a proper Christology. Now, converts to Catholicism, people especially who leave, say, a Bible teaching environment, and they become Catholics, they often struggle, and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'll accept, you know, Catholicism, but I have a hard time with these Marian doctrines, dogmas, because I can't find them in the Bible. And this is a regular issue. And then on Catholic Answers and programs where you can call in and talk to Catholic apologists, they're constantly getting questions about these sorts of things. So they found ways of defending these Marian doctrines and dogmas, and the way they do it is with typology. And they Note how the idea of utilizing typology, we're, we're really being told by Mike Winger that it's a modern day thing. In order to be able to deal with Mariology, we have now utilized typology as if that is the modern day kind of thing. Tune in more. Say, ah, maybe, maybe it's not clearly taught in the New Testament, but it's pictured in the old and therefore it's true. So we're going to unpack that. Um, let me, let me, uh, we're going to play clip number one. So get that ready. But this is a gentleman named Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn is a Catholic apologist. The video I got this clip from has like over 200,000 views. He goes around defending Catholicism. He used to be uh, uh, non-Catholic and now he's Catholic. He says he used to be anti-Catholic. I've never been that. <laughs> but, but, but yeah. It seems like all the converts always talk about how oh, hateful right. they were of Catholics. And I was like, well, maybe that was a problem. But um, yeah, we're not on that page. Uh, we love Catholics. We just think that True. the theology of Catholicism is wrong. Let's just go dig up a picture for it to justify our belief in this thing. And that's a problem. So... The problem is not realizing how important and how biblical typology is. That is a problem with Mike Winger. Our approach, indeed the ancient approach, is that the Old Testament is very clear. Is very clear in presenting types and shadows to us, as the great St. Augustine would, would call them. So we realize that. When we look in the New Testament, indeed, I mean, you look at the book of Hebrews, you look at Hebrews, you look at the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, Luke, John, and on and on and on. You have got to then turn to the Old Testament to fully get pictures of the Holy Ghost as Yahweh, of Christ, in particular, the one thing that comes to mind is, uh, is the reworking of the Shema. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, the, the Shema reworked in 1 Corinthians 10. So to claim that when we look into the Old Testament, that we're, oh, well, you know, we're only digging and digging for shadows. And really, you know, we're kind of extrapolating what is not there. It's a big problem here. Because on the one hand, I can sympathize with Winger, who doesn't know uh, Catholicism, but if he did know a little bit about the faith, he'd realize that what we're digging for is not taking pieces here and there and then putting a puzzle together, but rather we're looking in areas where there is a clear connection. Look, even the book of Judges, the original Greek is being utilized by St. Luke. That rises above mere typology to say, hey, that shadow in the Old Testament is being brought out even clearer in the New. 
if the language utilized for the Ark of the Old Covenant is utilized for St. Mary, well, that tells you that that beautiful imagery in the Old Testament is being brought out even clearer in the New. And there are limits to this because you look at what the Father is viewed and you recognize they're doing the very same thing we are. We're not inventing anything. St. Paul did it. St. Paul did it. In 1 Corinthians, let's make this a little bigger. 10, 11, we read. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples or as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. St. Paul is talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about these things happened as an example. But you don't get the full picture in the English. These things happened to serve as an example. Well, the incredible thing is, when we look at these things that have happened, that serve as examples, you literally have typology here. The Greek word is tupikos, tupikos. And if you look at the usage of that Greek word, typically as an example or warning or figuratively, what is St. Paul utilizing it as? Serving as an example, as a type, the exact word we utilize for typology. Right there in 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul tells us these things happened to them to serve as an example. Tauta de tupikos. You go on and on and read more. And you recognize what is being talked about. St. Paul is telling you things happen in the Old Testament to serve as types, typology. And those types were written down, what for? To instruct us. Indeed, that is why any good Jew would have recognized when Elizabeth shouts in the presence of Mary that that particular Greek word is utilized in ark kind of services in the Old Testament in the Greek Septuagint. Any good Jew would have recognized that. That is why we look to types. We don't merely look and say, oh, well, look, well, the ark is shiny. Mary must have been shiny. That means Mary was immaculate. No. Rather, we put together theology that is a direct connection in the Bible, directly in the New Testament, connecting to the old. The kind of typology that we're talking about is the typology that clearly is hearkening to something that you can find in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of it. We're going to look at it in a moment. There's a ton. Mike Winger will tell you, well, you know, I don't, I don't find any of it there. But there's a lot. And we have my dear brother, my dear brother, Steve Ray, as help here. By the way, if you are wondering about this typology, I've done a show with my brother, Steve Ray, and I go check it out. And check his website out. I'm using it right now. This is a document he sent me. I mean, look at all the parallels. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Let's share with you three examples of this typology. We'll play clip two. This is what he says and how he gets doctrines about Mary from pictures supposedly of Mary in the Old Testament. Now you might be thinking, how does this apply to Mary? Quite simply. You see, if Jesus is the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve. If Jesus is the new Moses, then Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. If Jesus is a new Solomon, the son of David, then Mary is the Queen Mother of the Son of David. The new is prefigured by the old, and the old is fulfilled in the new. And you can see why I'm concerned in doing a series on typology that I might, in my, if I don't cover this, I might open the door for this sort of thinking.
to people. So let's deal with it very plainly, right? He gives three types, and this is very normal. This is normal Catholic teaching here. This is not like Scott Hahn's not on his own here. This is the standard line for how they deal with these issues. When he says that Mary's the new Eve, he uses the new Eve to bring in the doctrine of immaculate conception. And he should. Eve was born without sin, therefore Mary's born without sin. When he says that Mary is the new ark, they use this to bring in the, the dogmas of um, uh, perpetual virginity, that she, was, she remained a virgin. I'll explain how in a minute. And also the bodily assumption. You don't need to utilize the ark typology alone to show that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. You don't need to do that. You can show the parallelism of the book of Judges. Somebody earlier brought up Numbers, uh, the book of Numbers, but the, the book of Numbers doesn't prove, it doesn't prove that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. It doesn't do that. What the book of Numbers does, it proves that uh, perpetual virginity was not an unusual thing. That is what it'll do. And that then will supplement what we're saying about Mary as not being out of the norm. Well, of course, it was not, uh, it was, it was not ordinary. But uh, it'll show that it wasn't an impossibility, and there is precedent for it. That is what it does. Do. They use this analogy about the ark to say, see, that proves Mary was assumed and a perpetual virgin. Then when he says that she's the queen mother, he uses this to bring out the divine maternity and her ability to intercede for us. So you can pray to Mary and she can go to Jesus on your behalf because she's the queen mother. So it's really, now most of you guys are with me, right? That's sketchy. Like you just made up theology. None of it is made up. Number one, touching upon Mary as a new ark. Uh, well, we'll get to the new ark in a bit. Mary as a new Eve. The problem with Mike Winger is Mike Winger does, does not even bother to go into the Bible to try and refute anything Scott is bringing up. Anything. Rather, what Mike Winger is doing <clears throat> is he's saying it out loud and, and laughing and mocking it. The problem is that clearly Mary is shown as a new Eve. It's biblical. You find it right there in Genesis 3. Give me one moment. Out of a picture that you, you say you found. But let's analyze these pictures more carefully. So let's, first we'll talk about new Eve. Is Mary the new Eve? Well, here's how they sell it. They sell it like this, or explain it like this. They say that Jesus is the new Adam. Mary's the new Eve. And they say Jesus supposedly said this in John chapter 2. That Jesus gave us this type in John chapter 2. And it's in John 2, 4. There they are at the wedding at Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2, verse 4. And Jesus said to her, woman, woman, that one word is going to be the key here. Woman. That one word does not mean Mary is a new Eve. Okay. Here is a problem with, uh, with Mike Winger. Is Mike Winger is running with particular portions of theology from a talk that Han gave and, and rather not bothering to deal with any of the main arguments. Number one, where is Mary presented as New Eve? In Genesis 3, which, by the way, I've done a whole, a ton of sessions. You can find shows that I've done on my channel alone. What, where, does, where is that brought out? In Genesis 3, we have an enmity between a woman and the serpent and the child and the devil as well. Now, how do we know that the devil is the serpent? It's biblical. We can find it right here. So Genesis 3, we have a serpent, the seed of the serpent, the woman, and the woman's seed. Now, the important theology that we grab there, why do we call Mary the new Eve? Because right before that, there are condemnations, if you will. There are consequences that must be paid for the fall in the garden. And this punishment, it befalls Adam and Eve. But right after, right there in verse 15, you have a messianic prophecy, what is called the Proto-Evangelium, or, as the fathers called it, the first gospel. Why? Because it is a prophecy of the Messiah that will come, and the Messiah that will defeat the devil, crush the head of the devil. That is what you find in verse 15. And that woman that will be at enmity, with the devil, there is no way that a woman could be Eve. How on earth could it be Eve if Eve was just one, one verse before shown to have fallen in the garden? And then you're telling me that that prophecy has to do with Eve? No, it's a new Eve, a mother of the Messiah, as the fathers massively interpreted. 
And it, I, I've lost count at the amount of fathers that viewed it that way. And is it the fathers alone? No. You find that come to fulfillment in Revelation 12, where you have that woman crowned in the heavens. The Greek word is uranos, in the heavens, and the devil is after her. How does that connect with Genesis 3? Perfectly, because we're told in Genesis 3 that that woman, that mother of the Messiah, would be at mortal warfare with the devil. Well, the woman in Revelation 12 is in mortal warfare as the devil is after her. He is after her. That is where we get Mary as new Eve, right there as soon as you open the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know even more so in Luke 1, because Mary is in possession of original justice. The kind of Greek that we find, you find that root word also in Ephesians 1, keratao, the form of it. The Greek word, obviously, is kekaritomene. Indeed, the only other place that's utilized is in the Deuterocanonical book of Sirach. But the root, keratao, is found in Ephesians 1. What kind of grace is there? The kind of grace that we all were meant to have and would have been in possession of had we not fallen in the garden, had Adam and Eve not fallen in the garden. Mary is in full possession of that grace in Luke 1. And for people wondering, well, William, where, where can I find out more information? We put out a whole article on that. And we will include that in an upcoming book on Mariology. But right now, and forever, it'll be free. You can find it in my blog. Not like when, I mean, look, when, when we put the book out, I'm not going to pull the article off. Everything remains up there for free. Kind of like we did before our Mary book came out. A lot of the material you find in here, not all of it, but I think about 40 to 50%, we released in free articles. So I'm not going to pull that later. If you want to read it whenever, you can, you can read it. You can find it in my blog. But how do we know that that, Identified in Wisdom 2. The, de the serpent is the devil. We read about it in Wisdom 2. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. Revelation shows us that the seed of the serpent are his angels, the demons. The woman, as we know, is the mother of the seed. It is the only logic, it is only logical that the seed of the woman would be the Messiah. That is why the fathers unanimously interpreted it as that way. The one to conquer death and evil. But both, both of them in Genesis 3 are shown to be at enmity with the devil. Look, if you're going to tell me that the Messiah is at complete enmity with the devil and never under the dominion of the devil, but then tell me the mother isn't, if they're both shown to be at enmity... You've got, to, you've got to do theology the proper way. Not only say, oh, well, look, I don't care. You know, I'll agree about the, um, the seed of the woman. But, you know, who cares about the mother? Look, I'm not arguing that, 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 the, original, that the original manuscript would read that the woman crushes the head. Nobody ever argues that. Nobody argues that. The dogma does not require that interpretation. But the dogma does rely on what the Bible says. And the Bible is very clear that that woman would be at enmity with the devil. So yeah, the immaculate conception is very clear there. Mary's all immaculate creation is very clear. How? If it was foreshadowed before she was even created that she would never be under the dominion of the devil. I think it's very obvious why the fathers interpreted that way. And I'd rather go with what the fathers said than what Mike Winger is about to tell you. What does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now, Jesus, when he says to her, woman, this is a special term referring to her as an equal, because this is a special word. There's a lot of Greek mumbo jumbo that comes out when I dig into sometimes Catholic apologetics. But there's a special Greek word that means equality, and he's elevating her position. And then later on in John 19, 26, he speaks to her again, one to the beginning of his ministry where he's turning water to wine, you know, and then at the end of his ministry, when he's on the cross, he says to her again in John 19, 26, 
Um, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. And that's that word woman again. So he's elevating her again. And uh, then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And that's also not when they do typology, but when they just say, behold your mother, they're saying she's the mother of all, of all Christians based upon that phrase with John, which there's several problems with that. Um, but that's a different video. I don't want to get into that topic right now. Um, you, can, you can definitely find that in John. But the better area to go to would be the book of Revelation, where she is clearly shown as the mother of the Christians. Clearly, there's no doubt about it there. So Mike Winger doesn't even bother going into that. The fact that he doesn't bother to attack that, we won't delve into that. But remember, you can find that in John and in the book of Revelation. Mike Winger won't dare touch that because Mike Winger knows he'll get shredded. He, he's trying to be careful here. Look, I'm going to be really honest with you. Mike Winger is trying to be careful, trying to hop around to make sure he doesn't make a major blunder. And I got to give him a tip of the hat, trying to make sure he doesn't make a major blunder and make a fool of himself. So he's trying to be very careful as to what arguments he's putting forth. They're bad either way, though. Talk about the typology. So first there's this. The, the word used in John 2, 4 and John 19, 26, they make a lot of this. I've heard it from multiple different Catholic apologists. It's the word gunai. Um, you guys want to know what gunai means? Woman. Is it special? No. Is it normal? Yes. Like the English word woman. It's just normal. You just say it when you're talking to females. This was the normal. And did Jesus even use it in a special way? No, not even in the gospel of John did Jesus use this in a special way. In John 4, verse 21, he's talking to the woman at the well. And it says, Jesus said to her, woman, gunai, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. The problem again with Mike Winger is Mike Winger is all over the map. Nobody ever argued that the mere Greek word for woman is indicative of something special for Mary. No, not at all. If Mike Winger would actually deal with the arguments, we'd have more substance here. Rather the argument, I'll tell you the way the argument goes. The argument goes very clearly that in John, there's a clear hearkening to the book of Genesis where that woman is the one who's shown to be at enmity with the serpent who is the devil. And how is that possible? Because in John, it is very unusual for a good Jew to refer to their mother as woman. It is unusual. Multiple scholars have shown this. Early fathers have shown this as well. So the Greek word for woman is not the argument here that is being made by Catholic scholars. They're not telling you, well, that Greek word, it has to mean that. No. No, Mike. Context is everything. It is everything. Only a fool would argue that a word utilized many times all over the Old Testament and New Testament in the Greek would have to be special for Mary alone. That is foolish. Context is what determines everything. And Mike doesn't deal with a lick of the context. And that should worry you. When Mike is misrepresenting my good friend, Dr. Hahn, and trying to argue and show him as a buffoon without even dealing with any of the arguments. He's like, oh, look, there's nothing special about that. Look, Mike, if you would deal with the actual arguments Dr. Hahn is putting forth and then try to refute them, you know, maybe you could, you'd have a good point. But thus far, he's dealt with nothing. Nothing at all. So Jesus talks to the woman at the well. Is he elevating her in some sense? Is he putting her down? No, he's just talking to her. It was a normal, appropriate way of addressing a female. That was just what it was. In John by the book, by the way, even in the book of Revelation, we have a woman clothed with a son. That woman is hearkening to the woman of the book of Genesis. And that woman is presented to us in the Gospel of John as well. So yeah, depending on context, <clears throat> there are words that are important. This, this is delusional. It would be like arguing that every time it would be, let me give you the kind of argumentation, the level of argumentation Mike Winger is putting forth. It would be like then saying, well, look, you have angelos used for creatures. Therefore, how can angelos be special for Christ? If in other areas you're arguing that Christ is the angelos 
the angel of the Lord. Well, angelos is used elsewhere for mere creatures. This is a bad argument, a bad argument. A mere Greek word, a mere Greek word is not what is important. It is the context that is important. How is that Greek word being utilized? How is that Greek word being employed by the author of the gospel, clearly being utilized by John on the island of Patmos, clearly being used and utilized in the gospel of John, clearly we realize in the book of Revelation, it's talking about that woman that would be at complete enmity with the devil and his wiles. But none of that is caught by Mike Wingman. It is, it is important. Who cares? You know, make a mockery. Look at other areas where woman is used. In fact, all Mike Winger did was go to Google. Woman, woman in the Bible. Well, there you go, guys. Must not be important. As if when a Jehovah's Witness argues that angelos is used elsewhere in the Bible and is referring to a creature, it would then, uh, it would then minimize the importance of when that Greek word angelos is used for that divine figure. In the Old Testament, this is this is ludicrous. This is embarrassing theology. On twenty fifteen, after he says, "Woman, behold your son," to Mary in John twenty fifteen, Jesus says to a different Mary who's there weeping at the tomb, "Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek?" Supposing him to be the gardener, she says, "Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away." So he referred. This is, in other words, this is just how Jesus talked to ladies. Now, sometimes in English, if you call a lady woman, hey woman, it actually comes off like it's an insult. That's not what's happening here. It's not an insult. It's just a normal, appropriate form of address for a lady. That's all. So they make a lot out of this. Can you, can you, I don't even, unless you hear them say it, you don't even know how, how did you get the new Eve out of Jesus saying woman? Plus he says it to other ladies too. And they're not elevated in it or changed in any sense because of it. This seems really strange. But there's more to it. And so I'm going to play a clip in a second of, of how he does this. But there's some juggling that goes on here. And what he does is he says in John 1, other Catholics do this too, but Scott Hahn kind of stands as representative of it. They say that there's these seven days of creation thematically in, in John 1 and John 2. And the moment when Jesus says, woman, you know, what does your concern have to do with me? When he says that, it's at the seventh day of the seventh day of creation, which symbolizes Adam and Eve and Eve, Adam naming Eve woman, according to Scott on the seventh day. So let's listen to this clip and then we'll unpack it and explain all the things that are wrong with it. So let's go ahead and play it. In John 2 verse 1, we read, on the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. So what does John mean when he says, on the third day, there was a marriage at Cana? So the next day, the first time would be day two. The next day, the second time would be day three. The next day, the third time would be day four. On the third day would bring us suddenly to the seventh day. And what happened in Genesis one and two? On day six, God made man, male, and then female. And in Genesis 2, we discover he wakes up the morning of the seventh day, and what does he spy? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and he says, woman. And so there on the seventh day is the sign of a marriage covenant between the first Adam and the first Eve. So what did the early church fathers discover in John 1 and 2? In the beginning was the word, light, darkness, life, creation, all of that. The next day, the next day, the next day, day four, the third day, leading us up to day seven. And there's this beautiful marriage, a wedding at Cana in Galilee. What is the first thing that Jesus says to his mother? Woman, what have you to do with me? That is a euphemism, an idiomatic expression in the Greek and the Hebrew, implying no disrespect whatsoever. In fact, it implies mutuality. So here on day seven, the new Adam coming to redeem the old creation that the first Adam had plunged into ruin. And along with the new Adam comes a new Eve. And along with the new Adam and the new Eve comes a mystical marriage, a mystical covenant, the new covenant. And on that occasion, he turns water into wine. This was the first sign to reveal his glory. Okay, so... 
This is the this is the reasoning. Now, let me just start by saying this. Is that clear Bible teaching that you just heard? It's huge leaps based on implications of adding up numbers. And I want you all to pay attention because what Dr. Han did was brilliant. And I tell you right now, Dr. Han is incredible. He's a very good friend of mine. And I'm proud to say he's incredible, the connection he made there. But Mike Winger is about to miss the whole point of what he made. The whole point. It's going to be missed here. And I'm going to show you how, because I want you to pay attention. And twisting the actual original Genesis story, along with, like, I mean, I read Genesis or uh, John 2, and I don't see an Adam theme for Jesus in this passage. So why would I even look for an Eve theme for anybody else? It's not, it's just not there. But let me talk about the issues. Okay. So John 1 does have a creation motif, but it's earlier in John 1. It's not later in John 1, right? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, right? All things were made through him. And it talks about light and all. So there is, is a creation motif, but then it just goes into story, the story, the actual history of John the Baptist. So in John 1, 29, 135 and 143, we have these next day phrases. And he tries to say that these are all part of a creation motif in John 1 and John 2. Here's the problem. When you actually look at them and you say, well, if the seventh day is somehow a creation motif, then I expect all the other days to be related too, right? To creation somehow. But if you actually just read the passage, which is a lot for us to read today, so I'm just going to skim through it. But um, okay, but first follow this. He says after the next day, next day, next day, he says the third day of John 2, 1 is, is actually the seventh day symbolizing God making Adam and Eve. And then Adam wakes up and he sees Eve and calls her woman on day seven, according to Scott Hahn. What does Genesis say? Day six. Why does Scott Hahn change it and make and act like it says day seven? Because he needs it to say that. Because when he added up the days in John, it was day seven. It doesn't fit the motif, but he's just going to say it. He does that a couple. But first, follow this. He you really need to pay attention because number one, Doctor Hahn did not argue that he created man and woman on day seven. He didn't argue that. Pay attention. He says after the next day, next day, next day, he says the third day of John 2, 1 is, is actually the seventh day symbolizing God making Adam and Eve. And then Adam wakes up and he sees Eve and calls her woman on day seven, according to Scott Hahn. What does Genesis say? Day six. Why does Scott Hahn change it and make and act like it says day seven? Because he needs it to say that. Because when he added up the days in John, it was day seven. It doesn't fit the motif, but he's just going to say it. He does that a couple times where he just honestly twists the scripture. Um, maybe on purpose, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about judging his heart, but I will judge his words. And his words are not biblical. So in John uh, chapter 1, verse 19 through 28. All right. Time to rip Mike Winger apart. Number one, Dr. Hahn never, ever claimed that day seven was when the woman, when Adam and Eve were created. Rather, Dr. Hahn made a masterful connection about what was it about? It was about a sanctification. It was about a blessing. He made a masterful connection. Indeed, in Genesis 2, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God <coughs> blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. In, in the particular Hebrew that we find there, we have something very important here about the sanctification that is occurring here. And don't take my word for it. I'm reading directly from it. The Dictionary of Classical Hebrew points out that the language used here means to consecrate, to set apart, or to declare holy, to declare inviolable. So what is actually being talked about here? Dr. Hahn is definitely correct. If his work, if what he has created is being made holy, how on earth does it not include the woman 
how does it not include the woman and the man? The literal dictionary of classical Hebrew tells us the language being utilized in Genesis chapter 2 is indicative of a blessing, of a sanctification, of a special blessing of setting apart, of declaring holy. Dr. Hahn never argued that on the seventh day, God created Adam and Eve. He didn't argue that. Rather, Dr. Hahn argued that there was something significant as the seventh day arrived, that significance of the blessing of the woman. And he's correct. There is a sanctification that occurs. And in the Hebrew, it is very clear that he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The Hebrew is very clear that what is being talked about here is a consecration. And there's more. I'll read more. Consecrate. And uh, I lost my... Okay. A particular special relationship is being spoken about here. Consecration. Talking about something that is no longer ordinary in one's eyes consecrated or set apart over and over anywhere you look at anywhere you look at here you recognize that there is importance that is happening in the seventh day god is blessing the day and sanctifying it there is a clear teaching here that this blessing is a significant one and that is what dr han is referring to dr han is not referring nor is dr han saying that on day seven, Adam and Eve were created, or the woman is created. Mike Winger really, really wrenched that completely out of context. But we go on. We get the first day in this, what Scott Hahn thinks is a creation motif, right? In day one, the, the religious leaders question John, and he tells of the one coming after him, which is going to be Jesus Christ. How is that related to creation? I have no idea. Neither does anybody else. In John 1, 29, we have the phrase the next day. So here's day two. And from 29 to 34, we have John the Baptist. He identifies Jesus as the one. He's like, behold, the Lamb of God. This is the guy I was telling you about. That's on the next day. How is that related to creation? I don't know. Neither does anybody else. In the next one, John 1, 35 to 42, that's day three. It says the next day again. And now Andrew and Simon, they go on to follow Jesus. The two of his disciples have been recruited. What he's going to do, he's going to go on and on. And we're going to fast forward a little because it would be pointless to, uh, to continue to belabor the point. We've already shown that he, doesn't, he, didn't, he did not get what Scott was trying to show there. In the parallelism, he didn't understand the sanctification, the blessing. He didn't even go to Genesis 2. He had no idea that, that uh, Dr. Hahn was hearkening to Genesis chapter 2. He had no clue. No clue. He didn't bother looking at any, any Hebrew dictionaries or Hebrew uh, or, or go and look at his scholarly commentary. He didn't even bother doing that. Rather, in his head, he heard, oh, Dr. Hahn said they were created on the seventh day. What a major blunder. What a fool. Unfortunately, had he done his actual homework, he wouldn't have made that major blunder. Now, also invited to the wedding with his. Where the first queen mother sinned, a new queen mother will arise in righteousness. He quotes authors Cazell, Robert Fouillet, Laurentin, Stuhlmuller, and many others. No doubt the queen mother has her place here in Genesis 3.15. She is clearly the queen mother from whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head. So what we find in the Davidic kingdom is the restoration of what God established in the creation kingdom way back in the beginning. I know some of you caught it where he actually just changed the Bible. Genesis 3.15 does not say that the woman and her seed will crush the head of the serpent. Why do you think he would change it to say that? From whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head.
Oh, Robert Fouillet, Laurentin Stuhlmuller, and many others. No doubt the Queen Mother has her place here in Genesis 3.15. She is clearly the Queen Mother from whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head. Did you catch that? Did you catch? I want you to pay attention because if you don't pay attention, you're not going to catch the masterful argument Dr. Han is putting forth. And indeed, my dear brother, Sam Shimon, put forth the same argument. But rather, you have Mike Winger trying to make the argument, oh, did you catch that? Dr. Han added to the Bible. He added to the Bible. Pay attention. I'm going to put it on again for you. Because if you don't catch this one point, you're not going to catch the major blunder made by Mike Winger. Where the first queen mother sinned, a new queen mother will arise in righteousness. He quotes authors Cazell, Robert Fouillet, Laurentin Stuhlmuller, and many others. No doubt the queen mother has her place here in Genesis 3.15. She is clearly the queen mother from whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head. She is the queen mother. The royal offspring will crush the serpent's head. Pay attention. I'm going to put it one more time. From whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head. So what we find in the Davidic kingdom is the restoration of what God established in the creation kingdom way back in the beginning. I know some of you caught it where he actually just changed the Bible. Genesis Did he change the Bible? Or does Genesis 3 actually tell you? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. His blind hatred for Catholicism. He heard Dr. Hahn claiming that the woman would crush the head. In his blind hatred for Catholicism, that is what he heard. But rather... Why not pay attention? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed. That is offspring. That is the Greek and the Hebrew word for offspring. He's talking about the royal Christ, the royal seed, the royal offspring that will crush the head of the devil. Where on earth do you gather? Where on earth do you hear him arguing that it is Mary that crushes the head of the devil. Yet you have Mike Winger hunched over, fuming. He's, he's, he's mad. Look at him. The guy's mad. Then claiming, well, look at what Dr. Hahn did. He added to the Bible. Ah, oh, shucks. But did he add to the Bible? Does the Bible not tell you that that sperm that seed that offspring will be royal <laughs> it will be royal and that offspring will crush the head of the devil uh, does it not does it not directly tell you that so what we find in the davidic kingdom is the restoration of what god established in the creation kingdom way back in the beginning i know some of you caught it many others no doubt the queen mother has her place here in genesis 3 15. she is clearly the queen mother from whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head so what we find she's the queen mother from whom royal offspring will arise and crush the head of the serpent now would Dr. Hahn be correct if he also argued that Mary played a role in crushing the head of the devil? Sure you would. Because we all play a role, don't we? Luke 10 tells you. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And you literally have it in the context of talking about Satan. It is talking about trampling 
over evil spirits. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Indeed, don't all of us who are truly, truly part of the Christian faith have that authority, according to the Bible? We sure do. So either which way, Dr. Hahn would have been correct. But Mike Winger was totally ripping him out of context. In the Davidic kingdom is the restoration of what God established in the creation kingdom way back in the beginning. I know some of you caught it where he actually just changed the Bible. Genesis 3.15 does not say that the woman and her seed will crush the head of the serpent. Why do you think he would change it to say that? Because he's trying to smuggle in new theology. So he just changes it. This is abuse of the text. Like, I'm not honoring God's word. Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you, God speaking to the serpent, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he, the offspring, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Not he and her. It's a single agent acting to, to destroy the serpent. That's the prophecy. And this isn't even a picture. This is a prophecy. Pictures and prophecies are not the same thing. Um, it's one agent acting. It's not the woman in the seed. And honestly, I find this shocking. But the reason why he smuggled that terminology in there, why he changed the wording there, which who knows who in the audience there even noticed it when he was teaching it. Um, the reason why he did that is because they're also, now it's not a, it's not a dogma, but it's a doctrine they're teaching and many Catholics want it to be a dogma that Mary's co-redemptrix, that she actually is one of the ones who helped redeem us and participate. Uh, you can find that directly in the book of Genesis. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to read of the woman. You don't need to read the Latin Vulgate rendering in order to be able to get that clear theology there. You don't, uh, a massive amount of fathers didn't utilize the Latin Vulgate rendering and they still taught that very clearly. Moving on. I uh, found an, uh, an article on National Catholic Register, which is a, a website um, where they promote uh, Catholic teachings and, and, and doctrines and things like that. And it, the title of the article was Amazing Parallels Between Mary and the Ark of the Covenant. So they're trying to draw parallels between the ark. We, we just did last time we did the, the temple and how the ark all represents Christ. They're saying that that's really about Mary. Now you might ask, how do you find that in the New Testament? And they find it in Luke 135. Luke 135. In Luke 135, it says, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That word overshadow is... Episkiazo, at least that's that's the lexical form of the, of the word. Um, Episkiase is another way to put it. But here's what the National Catholic Register, their website, said about this word and how they use it to say that this proves, this, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, proves that she is the new ark. They say, and I quote, the Greek word for overshadow is episkiase, which describes a bright, glorious cloud. Notice their description of this Greek word. It describes a bright, glorious cloud. It is used with reference to the cloud of transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17, 5, Mark 9, 7, and Luke 9, 34, and also has connection to the Shekinah glory of God, Exodus 24, 40, and 1 Kings chapter 8. Um, but if you actually look up this word, episkiazo, or episkiase, in a Greek dictionary, you find out that it doesn't mean anything bright or glorious. Do you know what it means? Write, write this down. This is important, right? Because you're going to find when you look up Greek words, it, you, they usually mean the same thing as they were already translated to mean in your Bibles. It means overshadow. That's all it means. They're just, it's just Greek gobbledygook. It's gobbledygreek is what it is. This is not, people try to sometimes manipulate others saying, oh, in the Greek, there's a special thing here. And usually in the Greek, there is definitely something very special at the overshadowing there of Mary. But I have not read the article in the Catholic uh, Review or wherever. If they would have argued that that Greek word does mean a bright cloud, they would have been wrong. He's right about that. Look, we have to admit whenever a, a point has been made, but do, do, does Catholic dogma require the cloud to have been a bright cloud? No, not at all. 
but now is that Greek word for overshadowed, is it ever used in conjunction with a Greek word that is indicative of brightness? Of course, you can find it in the transfiguration. You can find it in other places. But that Greek word in and of itself does not mean bright cloud. It has to be supplemented with another Greek word to be indicative of it being a bright, a brightness being present with it. He's right about that point, but he's not right when he tries to minimize the importance of that Greek word when applied to the overshadowing uh, there present in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to examine how he's wrong. Really, that's not the case. For instance, the same author of Luke 135, the same guy wrote the book of Acts, right? Luke wrote Acts as well. And in Acts 5.15, he uses the exact same word. And he's talking about Peter and how Peter was traveling. And they wanted Peter's shadow to fall on them that they might be healed. Let me read the passage and ask yourself if you think this means a, quote, um, bright, glorious cloud. So... Acts 5.15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Obviously, Peter is being followed by a bright and glorious cloud. No, that's just not what it means. Like, this is just, it's, it's not true. It's just not true. But from that word, overshadow, they say that relates to the, to the tabernacle. By the way, the word, that word is never used uh, related to the tabernacle in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I look for relates to the to the tabernacle by the way the word that word is never used uh related to the tabernacle in the septuagint it relates to the to the tabernacle by the way the word that word is never used uh related to the tabernacle in the septuagint it relates to the to the tabernacle by the way the word that word is never used uh related to the tabernacle in the septuagint in the greek translation of the old testament i look for it I maybe you need to look a little bit harder there mike winger is not very good at this thing we call theology. Not very good at all. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The piskiatsin, the Greek word. Now, here is the problem that we've got here. The problem we have here is that uh, Mike Winger doesn't know a lick of Greek, any Greek at all. I'm going to tell you what Mike Winger did. What Mike Winger did was Mike Winger probably did a word search. He doesn't realize there's different forms of the same Greek word. So he'll do a word search. Couldn't find it. That's it. Mike Winger doesn't know Greek. He can't read Greek. You've got it, but let me, let me remind you one thing. I can find more areas where that Greek word, uh, that very Greek word he says, is never connected to the tabernacle. I can find multiple ones, but one would suffice. And we've got one right here. You've got that very Greek word he said. He looked and looked and couldn't find it. Connected with the tabernacle. Skene, right there. Mike Winger has done what we call a hatchet job here. This is a horror show. This is a horror show. This is a hatchet job of theology. This is as poor as you can get. If this is what we have to refute Catholicism on Mariology and typology, then Protestantism is bankrupt. And I feel very bad letting people know this is awful. Really, really bad material. If you are using this to share with family and friends and th thumping your chest as if Mike Winger has just taken Catholicism to the woodshed, I've got to really tell you, this is embarrassing. This is really bad. I can't find it. Um, yeah, you can't it's, find it's it. other words that are used. Um, uh, I won't get into all the details there, but but basically, 
this is fabricated. This is a fabricated connection. It's not established in the text. Um, but then the same article goes on to list four connections between the Ark and Mary to try to establish that she really is a picture. The Ark is a picture of Mary. So I'll give the four connections. And they're all from 2 Samuel 6 and Luke chapter 1. So Luke chapter 1, 2 Samuel 6, these two looked at together are supposed to give us the idea that Mary is this, um, uh, this Ark of the Covenant. So in 2 Samuel 6, 9, when the Ark is coming to David and he's receiving it after he's become king, he's very happy, right? He's very excited about the ark. And it says <clears throat> in chapter 6, verse 9 of 2 Samuel, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Now parallel that to what happened when Elizabeth found out that Mary was coming to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Elizabeth, as Mary's pregnant, Elizabeth says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And it's the phrase come to me that's highlighted here. Right? David's like, how could the Ark of the Lord come to me? And Elizabeth says, how could the mother of my Lord come to me? Mother of the Lord, Ark of the Lord, she's the Ark. Right? The Ark's a container. She's containing Jesus Christ. Right? The, the, all the things that were in the Ark represented Jesus. She's holding Jesus. This is the idea. The problem is, 2 Samuel in context doesn't look like a very good picture. The reason why, why, why David says this, how can the Ark come to me, is because Uzzah just touched the Ark and was slain. And David's, David's not welcoming the ark. He's rejecting it now. He's not like Elizabeth. Oh, this is so wonderful. No, he's like, no, it can't come to me. And he doesn't accept it into his home or into his palace or into anywhere he wanted it to go. Because he was not worthy. His reply was an incredulous one, winger. Not one of horror and one of rejection. It was one of incredulity because touching the ark would render one dead because of the sacredness. The connection is right there with Elizabeth being shocked at the holiness that she was in the presence of. That is what was shocking to her, just like it was shocking in the Old Testament. Both are instances of incredulity, but Mike Winger didn't catch that. Don't worry, we're going to look at the parallelism with the ARC typology in a moment. Go. Let me read it to you in, in context. 2 Samuel 6, verses 5 through 11. Let's read the whole passage. Because if, if we have a consistent type, it should have, as I've said before, multiple points of correspondence that are consistent. It does have multiple. It has a ton of them. And we're going to look over them in a moment. Don't worry. In one moment, we will. Don't worry. And if there are any details I've left out, Look, I'm, I'm not trying to get any money from you. Uh, you don't even need to pay a penny. If you have Kindle Unlimited, you can begin reading our book on Mary right now for free. If you have Kindle Unlimited, if there are any details I forget, we break down everything in a meticulous fashion in the Greek there on the arc typology, the direct connection there. So if there's anything, I cannot go through everything uh, in one session. There's a ton of it. Please look it up. There are a ton of parallels. I'm going to show you a ton of them tonight. We're going to bury these horrific arguments being put forth by Mike. We're going to call it a type. So 2 Samuel 6, 5. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps. Lyres, the lyres, the, the instrument, not like people telling lies. That would be a weird way to celebrate. And harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they had come to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error and he died there because the ark because the ark of God and David was angry because the, the Lord had broken out against Uzzah and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said how can the ark of the Lord come to me and let's just keep reading the next verse so David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David and, but is that parallel with Elizabeth somehow? How can you come to me? You can't go away. Like she, he doesn't, she doesn't reject Mary that the connection doesn't, doesn't hold. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, if Elizabeth had housed Mary in somebody else's house, maybe it would be a better case for a connection there. Um, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So what's the connection between Mary and Elizabeth? It's literally just the phrase, come to me. That's the whole connection. There's a second connection that they'll try to give. Um, by the way, when Jesus came to John to be baptized, what did John say? 
in Matthew 3, 14, John says, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? So here's a come to me passage that's not, and Mary's not there. So I don't know what they do with that one. Um, number two, the second connection that this website gives is that Elizabeth was loud and the people. Before we get to that one, I want to examine the incredible imagery of Mary's ark. I like looking at um, the catechism. Number one, the catechism is very clear. Mary, in whom the Lord himself has just made his dwelling, is the daughter of Zion in person, the ark of the covenant, the place where the glory of the Lord dwells. She is the dwelling of God with men. Even scholar Raymond Brown, the liberal scholar, recognizes the symbolism of Mary as Ark of the Covenant or as the tabernacle of divine glory. Well, the key to the symbolism, he says, is Luke 1, 35. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Ark of the Old Covenant. Let's go on a little bit more. The Catechism. In the Theophanies of the Old Testament, the cloud, now obscure, now luminous, is this as big as I can make it? Try to make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Reveals the living and saving God while veiling the transcendence of his glory with Moses on Mount Sinai at the tent of meeting and during the wandering of the desert and with Solomon at the dedication of the temple. In the Holy Spirit, Christ fulfills these figures. The Spirit comes upon the Virgin Mary and overshadows her so that she might conceive and give birth to Christ. On the mountain of transfiguration, the spirit in the cloud came and overshadowed Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, Peter, James, and John. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. Finally, the cloud took Christ out of the sight of the disciples on the day of his ascension and will reveal him as son of man in glory on the final day, on the final uh, on the day of his final coming. The glory of the Lord overshadowed the ark and filled the covenant. Remember what Luke 1, 39, 45 says, and we're going to read it, then we're going to look at the parallels. We're going, to crush, we're going to crush this heresy. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. There are a number of, of, uh, of parallels found here, but I love looking at the amazing job done by my dear brother, Steve Ray. Go look at the show we've done together in this very, uh, of the typology here. Look at the parallels that we have here. The Ark of the Old Covenant traveled to the house of Obed-Edom in the hill country of Judea. Well, Mary travels to the house of Elizabeth and Zechariah in the hill country of Judea. Dressed as a priest, David danced and leapt in front of the Ark. John the Baptist, as we know, of priestly lineage, biblical and uh, taught by all the patristics, leapt in his mother's womb at the approach of Mary. You find that. Uh, Mary, uh, Elizabeth is filled, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and the baby leaps in the womb. David asks, who am I that the ark of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth asks, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Of course, as all ark typology is connected directly to Mary as mother of God, everywhere you find in Luke 1, that Greek word gideos or kudios, every time it's utilized, it's in reference to Yahweh, almighty God. Luke 1.43 is no difference, is, is no different at all. Clearly, she's referring to Christ incarnate God. Who am I that the mother of my Lord? Here, Kudios is in reference to Yahweh. Very important. And then the other parallelism, David shouting in the presence of the ark. Elizabeth cries out in the presence of Mary. We're going to look at that particular Greek word in a moment. The ark remained in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Mary remained in the house of Elizabeth for three months. The house of Obed-Edom was blessed by the presence of the ark. And the word blessed is utilized multiple times in Luke 1. The ark returns to its home and ends up in Jerusalem, where God's presence and glory is revealed in the temple. 
Mary returns home and eventually ends up in Jerusalem where she prevent, presents God incarnate in the temple. Now, the parallels go on and on. There are multiple parallels. Indeed, if we look in Luke 142, you have what an, this is, this is massive. And we're going to get to it in just a moment. Indeed, the parallels don't end there. Uh, they go on and on. And we'll look at them in just one moment. But before we get to them, I want you all to meditate on what you have here. You have multiple parallels that typology are not merely ripping uh, jagged pieces that don't fit a puzzle. No, typology is, as St. Paul tells you, an example is put forth, and that example has come to a fuller picture in the New Testament. It's very clear what is being said here about Mary. Particular Greek words are being utilized. That Greek word for overshadow is utilized all over the Old Testament in reference in particular to that glory cloud, and it is found in the tabernacle. But the parallelism doesn't end there, does it? People of God were loud when the ark came, and there's these two verses. So second, so I don't know what they do with that one. Um, number two, the second connection that this website gives. I want you to catch how utterly confused Mike Winger is. Is that Elizabeth was loud, and the people of God were loud. Look at that. Look at the mockery. He has no idea why it is important to zero in on that particular Greek word utilized by Elizabeth. He has no idea, no clue. I want you all to pay attention. When the ark came, and there's these two verses. So 2 Samuel 6, 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And then Luke 1, 42. Elizabeth, she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. There's a problem with this. For one, it's just loudness. That's not really all that specific. I feel like we need a lot more points of compatibility to call it a type. Really? Uh, you know, Mary's, you know, Elizabeth's being loud. You know, we need more points of connection. Okay. 1 Chronicles 15, 28. 1 Chronicles 16, 4. 1 Chronicles 16, 5. 1 Chronicles 16, 42. 2 Chronicles 5, 13. Everywhere you look, Let's look at 1 Chronicles 16, 4 and 5. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings, peace offerings for God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed everyone, uh, everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God. Asaph, the chief, and next to him Zechariah, then Jael, Shemir, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mattithiah, Eliab, Benaiah, and Obadidim, Jael, with stringed instruments and harps. But Asaph made music with cymbals. Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. I want you all to look very careful because in verses 4 and 5, there are particular words being utilized here. Now, what is the particular word for sound, for greeting, for noise that is being made here? Every point you look at here is the exact Greek word utilized in Luke 142 for the loud exclamation of Elizabeth. But it doesn't end there. Pay attention. 1 Chronicles 15, 28. Then all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the, of the comet, of the cornet, and with trumpets and with cymbals, cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. More loudness. But it's just being loud, right? 2 Chronicles 5, 13. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music and praised the Lord. Now, what is important about 2 Chronicles 5.13? 
Well, it has to do with the ark. It has to do with the ark. All over the place. Look at that. All over the place. Do you see that? Every time we have that particular Greek word used, two chronicles, one chronicles, one, two, three, four, five, six, three, six times used, five times utilized before Luke 142. What is so important about it? Every time it's used, it is in connection with the Ark of the Covenant. Every time we find that Greek word used, it is with praise of the Lord and with the Ark of the Covenant being referenced in the Greek Septuagint. But Mike Winger didn't know that because Mike Winger hasn't done his homework. The significance of the word utilized for Elizabeth would not have fallen on deaf ears for a good Jew. That is why the early church fathers. That is why the patristic pillars, as I like to call them, would have interpreted all of that we're looking at in the very same manner. That is why Methodius of Olympus says, for if to the ark, which was the image and type of thy sanctity, such honor was paid of God, that to no one but to the priestly order only was the access open to it, or ingress allowed to behold it, the veil separating it off and keeping the vestibule as that of a queen. What and what sort of veneration is due to thee from us who are of creation the least, to thee who art indeed a queen, to thee the living ark of God? For since thou, O holy virgin, hast donned as a bright day upon the world, and has brought forth the sun of righteousness. That hateful horror of darkness has been chased away. The power of the tyrant has been broken. Death has been destroyed. Hell swallowed up. And all enmity dissolved before the face of peace. Proclus, Eve has been healed, and Mary is venerated, adored, because she has become mother and handmaid cloud and chamber and ark of the lord by the way some of these translations are new and fresh translations done by that master my dear friend father coppets so some of these are fresh translations for this cause let us say to her blessed are you among women who alone has healed the grief of eve who alone has borne the world's price hezekias arise lord into thy rest Thou and the ark of thy sanctification, which is very evidently the virgin mother of God. For thou art the pearl with good reason. Is she the ark? St. Jerome. Behold one in truth, the handmaid of the Lord. Holy she is in whom is no guile, all simplicity. The spouse of Christ is the ark of the covenant. Within and without, overlaid with gold, the keeper of the law of the Lord. The apostle, Thuz, defines the virgin, that she should be holy in body and spirit. The Dormition and the Assumption, St. John Damascene. Today, the living, the holy living ark of the living God, the one who carried her own maker within herself, comes to her rest in the temple of the Lord, not made by hands. David, her ancestor, and God's leaps for joy. The angels join in the dance. The archangels applaud. The virtues give praise. The principalities rejoice for them. The powers exult. The, dom the dominations delight. The thrones make festival. The cherubim sing their hymn, and the seraphim glorify God. St. Andrew of Crete. What they all saw surely filled them with fear. The bearer of life, now born away by death. Her who spoke with God now voiceless, her who bore life in her womb as in an ark, now dead, breathless, lying on a couch, Theodore the student. Today that ark of holiness wrought with gold and divinely furnished 
has been lifted up from her tabernacle on earth. And it's born towards the Jerusalem above to unending rest. And David, the ancestor of God, poet as he is, strikes up a song for us and cries, virgins, meaning souls, will be led to the king, to you, O God, behind her. There are more. Indeed, there are multiple fathers. Anti-Nicene, Nicene, post-Nicene. Those that spoke of the Dormition and the bodily assumption homilies were almost unanimous in all connecting Mary as that new ark of the new covenant with Mary as all immaculate and Mary as the one whose Dormition was from the glory of her great God and Savior Christ who bodily assumed her body and soul into heaven. We continue. I wouldn't care if it was a type. If Mary's going to be the ark, fine, Lord, you can make her the ark. It doesn't mean she's born without sin and she is physically assumed into heaven. Like That's just wrong. But this is actually three months later now. So what we want to do is parallel David greeting the ark with Elizabeth's greeting of Mary, except what in the parallel, they're bouncing around the timeline of 2 Samuel 6. So at first, it's David rejecting the ark. And then three months later, he goes, okay, let's bring the ark back. Let's let's make sacrifices and bring the ark in. That's when they're shouting, and that and Elizabeth she greeted her at the first time. So, and there was no blessing; it was just loudness. It's just paralleling loudness, which seems a little weak to me. And then the third connection is leaping, <clears throat> leaping in Second Samuel six fourteen, when three months after Uzzah, then they bring the ark in, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. That's also 1 Chronicles 15.29. So um, we have him dancing in 2 Samuel. In 1 Chronicles, we have the word leaping specifically. Luke 1.44, here's what Elizabeth says. For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. So this is, again, three months later. These are two separate events. And they're trying to smash them together to create a type. <clears throat> but the dancing is not Elizabeth, is it? If Elizabeth's supposed to be David, then why is John dancing? Is John David? Well, then Elizabeth was the one shouting and saying, come to me. So this, this whole type is just kind of kind of like patchwork smashed together. It's not really how we like to do this sort of thing. And then the fourth connection, the final connection that they say, these are remarkable connections, best examples of how Mary's the Ark of the New Covenant, <clears throat> is the, the term three months. So 2 Samuel 6, 10, so David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. Now, of course, all the other parallels, or parallels two and three, the second and third one, they come after all this, but they're saying that it's just all mishmashed. Um, Luke 1, 39, um, Actually, Luke 156. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. So Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. So there's a three-month connection between the two passages. Here's my problem. First, Elizabeth is David. David. Then Elizabeth is all Israel, shouting. Then she's David again in the third example, um, or the second example, I should say. Then John is David when he's leaping. Then Elizabeth is Obed-Edom when she's bringing the ark to her house, because that's where he, the ark stayed. It was Obed-Edom's house, not David's house. How ridiculous and embarrassing is that? Who on earth ever says, who ever says that Elizabeth, okay, you know, Elizabeth is David, you know, Elizabeth is David, that these characters, all of them must be types of those other individuals. Where on earth does that theology follow? Where? In order for Elizabeth to be a type of David or any of these other figures to be types that he is hearkening to, there would have to be parallels with the person, not merely utterances. There would have to be parallels with the person. Mike Winger is really, really desperate. And I've got to be quite honest with you. This is, a, this is as poor as... Look, there has been nothing, nothing of substance put forth yet. Now I know why Mike Winger would never debate anyone that knows their theology, their Mariology, on the topic of the Virgin Mary. Now I know why. Um, so it's, it just doesn't make sense. Like the type doesn't hold together very well. It's not well constructed. But even if it was, it doesn't give you the theology they get. 
Listen to this. Here's a quote from that same article on uh, ncregister.com. Thus, by analogy, it was fitting and proper for Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, Theotokos, bearer of God, who had the sublime honor of carrying God incarnate in her womb to be exceptionally perfect, exceptionally perfectly holy. All of this gymnastics is done to say that Mary is holy and sinless. That's the idea. She's, she's without sin. She's without sin. This is how they get theology from this. Another um, article on catholic.com, called, um, uh, which I'll quote. Uh, actually, I've been quoting from the same article, catholic.com. There's NC Register. I'll put the links in the video description for people who want to look at this stuff. But here's this, this article. They quote it like this. They say, God was very specific about every exact detail of the ark. I, we all agree there, right? It was a place where God himself would dwell. God wanted his words inscribed on stone, housed in a perfect container covered with pure gold within and without. How much more would he want his word Jesus to have a perfect dwelling place? If the only begotten son were, take, were to take up residence in the womb of a human girl, would he not make her flawless? Right? Like, wouldn't he? That's not how we do theology. Like, if God loves everybody, won't he save everybody? I mean, wouldn't he? Like, that's not how you do theology, guys. Like, that's reckless and dangerous theology. So it doesn't argue for New Testament truth. It just starts with Catholic theology and tries to push it into patchwork pictures in the Old Testament. So here's some problems. We've already answered all of those arguments that there are no parallels. We've already looked at that. Now, is there anything of substance here in Mike Winger? We're going to continue watching. Um, the ark is actually not filled with God. Where was the presence of God in the temple or the tabernacle? Above the ark, outside of it, in between the cherubim who had their wings outstretched. So the ark is not filled with the presence of God. That's not the case. The tabernacle, in the very passages they quote, I won't read them to you for the sake of time, but in the Ezekiel, and, or sorry, Exodus. I would like to point people to, by the way, again, for a much deeper treatment of, of what was inside the ark, Go watch the full show that I did with my good brother, um, Steve Ray. But again, more, what was in the Old Testament art from my brother, Steve Ray? The Old Testament tells us that one item was placed inside the ark while in the Sinai wilderness as a witness of the people of Israel. God had given Moses the Ten Commandments written on stone with his own fingers. God told Moses to put the tablets in the ark so they would always be at the heart of their worship. Hebrews 9, 4 tells us that two additional things were placed in the ark. The ark of the covenant covered in all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which were budded, and the tables of the covenant. Each of the three had profound significance and were always to be with the people in the very presence of God in the ark. This idea that what is inside the ark, it, to kind of minimize the importance of what was inside the ark, or the ark itself, is shocking. Shocking coming from Mike Winger, where you have to go because Mike Winger is reading and reading and realizing, okay, well, what if any of these parallels do work? What do I do? Oh, I'm going to minimize the importance of the Ark. I'm going to attack the Ark of the Covenant because, well, you know, if it does turn out that those parallels are real, well, who cares? The Ark really isn't that important anyway. Yeah, who cares, right? You need to be very careful when hearing videos done by individuals like this, that if your faith is, is rock solid and strong, I mean, aim into that. Watch away. But if you are easily moved and bothered by things, Mike Winger can easily affect your faith. Not because he's not, look, he's not even an eloquent talker but because he's all over the map. His theology is so poor. And I, look, I got to be honest, it's pathetic. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. 
I, mean, I do not mean to be disrespectful in any way, it's pathetic. And when you have pathetic theology, you can mislead people because you don't know what you're talking about. And he has a lot of people that watch his videos. And very easily, he can lead people to darkness because that fullness of the faith is nowhere to be found within anything being uttered by, by Winger. Uh, in particular, the tabernacle gets this cloud covering it, but not specifically the ark. So they're saying she's the ark, but it's the tabernacle that has the covering, not specifically the ark. Um, and the tabernacle, as we understand, represents Christ. The tabernacle was the dwelling, um, not the ark. God's spirit was above and outside of the ark. It was behind the veil. It was not under the lid. There's a bit, just a difference there. And this breaks the picture apart for us. Mary's never called the ark in the New Testament, not even once at any point, which would be interesting if she was, then we could look at these pictures, you know. And this, of course, creates new theology. We've already looked at every parallel that clearly shows you Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant, particularly Greek words utilized only for the Ark, being utilized for Mary, all of those parallels being used, and the parallels taught as well in the early church. There is no doubt that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. That has already been established. Do you need for Mary's name to be changed to Ark for you to believe that Mary is the Ark? Goodness. Uh, one Catholic apologist in a debate I saw on the Marian dogmas, a guy named Peter Williams, he says that because you wouldn't use the Ark to store ordinary things after storing the tablets and the manna and the, um, and the rod that had budded, you would never put normal stuff in there. Therefore, Mary wouldn't be used for ordinary births and child carrying after carrying Jesus. So you see why they want to establish this connection between Mary and the Ark is to import the perpetual virginity of Mary into the text when it's really never there. They also import the bodily assumption with this Ark analogy. The problem with what Mike Winger is putting forth is, is to minimize the importance of the art. Really ridiculous, really, really, uh, really shocking how. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, with the Ark of the Covenant came the presence of God, very clearly came the presence of God. That connection is very, very present there with Mary. That is a parallelism that is being drawn. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Catch that. I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony with the ark came the presence of god with the ark came the presence of almighty god this cannot be minimized the idea that mike winger is trying to minimize the importance of the ark should shock you it really should even if you are not a fully believing catholic because he's trying to minimize the importance of such a monumental massive chapter in ancient Jude Jewish and Christian history just to attack Mariology. Pay attention. Because in Revelation eleven nineteen, it says that John saw the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. So Mary's the Ark, so Mary must have been taken up into heaven, bodily assumed. This is, this is offensively bad theology, is what it is. The third one and the final one we'll do, I think it's the final one we'll do tonight, is that, that Mary's the queen mother. She's the queen mother. And this is sounds really good until you look at the details. Um, and don't get me wrong. Hey, man, if you show me in the scripture that says that Mary can intercede for me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray to Mary. I trust God's holy word. Okay? But this is the problem is that when some, some of the Catholic teachings, when you try to get people who... I'm glad Mike went to Revelation 11 because it's definitely correct. 
Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Remember that chapters and divisions were not originally there in the Bible. So Revelation 11 is directly connected with Revelation 12. The temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet, and on her head a garland or a crown of 12 stars. Now, in Revelation 11, what do we have? We have a vision of heaven. In Revelation 11, it's a continuous teaching. They're connected. In Revelation 11, there's a vision of the temple of God was opened in heaven. That Greek word for heaven is right there, oranos. And the ark of its covenant was seen. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. The thread of theology continues, Mike. A woman clothed with the sun. Now, is that woman not Mary? Well, if you want to argue that that woman is not Mary, you're going to have a lot of trouble because that woman bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That refers to the Messiah in the Old Testament. Who would have given birth to the one that was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron? It would have been the mother of the Messiah. It would have been Mary. Mike Winger is right that we definitely hearken to Revelation 11. Because Revelation 12 is connected right there to Revelation 11. Who care about the scriptures and I want it in the Bible kind of people. You know, when you try to get us on board, you start doing weird things. Um, so let's, we'll, we'll play clip seven in a second here. Um, but Solomon, Solomon's the son of David, Scott Hahn says. And therefore, Jesus is the ultimate son of David. And just as Bathsheba was Solomon's mother, the queen mother, so Mary is the ultimate queen mother. And, um, and let's listen to, listen for the reasoning, listen for how he gets you there and listen for the Catholic teaching about her interceding for you. Um, yeah, and then we'll talk about it. But what's so interesting to me, what I recall vividly studying as a Protestant, focusing upon the biblical record of David's kingdom, what really jumped off the page was a passage in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. For there we see Solomon's mother going into the royal court, the royal chamber, where everybody bows before King Solomon, now that he is newly crowned, freshly anointed. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Solomon's half-brother Adonijah, the king rose to meet her. And he bowed down to her. And then he sat on his throne and had a throne or a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. And from that position, at the king's right hand, she gave to him royal petitions. Not just from royal subjects, but from his own brethren who preferred to go through his mother rather than going directly to Solomon himself. So this sounds like this was a normal thing, right? Bathsheba, it was just known. Even his brothers, plural, brothers, brethren, would go through Bathsheba rather than Solomon. And this was considered accepted. What is he implying? That, the, uh, that a Catholic person who says, I just like praying through Mary. Don't worry. Even Solomon's brothers went through Bathsheba. But let's look at that passage a little more carefully. And see, is this, is this really saying Bathsheba interceded? Does this relate to Mary? Is it saying that Mary intercedes and that's okay? Well, let's look at it. Let's pretend that this is a picture about Mary. So 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 13. Just so you know, Adonijah was someone who wanted to steal the throne from Solomon. It's not considered a generally good thing to do. And um, that's the context. So <clears throat> 1 Kings 2, 13. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And she said, do you come peacefully? He said, peacefully. Then he said, I have something to say to you. She said, speak. 
He said, you know that the kingdom was mine and that all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brothers for it was his from the Lord. So nice pious language there. It was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said to him, speak. And he said, please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife, this woman who had lain with David to warm him in this rather interesting story. It makes us all feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, you're like, why did you guys do that? But, um, but anyways, he wants Abishag. Verse 18, Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to you for the king. So here's the passage where that Scott refers to where she goes and intercedes for Solomon's brethren. Well, one brother, one time. Verse 19, so Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. And she sat on his throne and he had a seat brought for the king. He sat on his throne, excuse me. That was, uh, that would be good Catholic theology right there. Um, he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right. Then she had her Abiathar, the priest, and Joab, the son of I fast forward. It was manipulative reading and it was the wrong way of doing things. <clears throat> fast forwarding because he's reading a lot of stuff. Well, don't worry, we're going to get to the queen, uh, the queen of heaven, uh, uh, usual argument you hear brought up all the time. No. The result, all you have to do is read, read the whole passage, right? He misquoted Genesis 3.15. He misapplies this passage right here. He just seems to consistently, he takes John and does all kinds of weird gymnastics with John 1 and 2 to try to say it's a seven-day creation motif and all this stuff. Just read the passage and you'll be safe. You will be safe. Now, what Mike Winger did there, because um, we kind of missed a little bit, let's rewind. Shall be put to death today. Throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother and she sat on his right. Then so what he's doing there is he's reading about, um, in the book of Jeremiah, uh, reading about the um, uh, definitely the con condemnatory queen of heaven, which the title definitely was a, a negative, was a one that had pointed to a negative figure. That is definitely correct. He's right about that. But the problem with Mike Winger's argumentation is, is a very elementary one. Mike Winger is correct. Uh, Asherah, who was known as the Queen of Heaven in the Old Testament, was a pagan figure, definitely a pagan goddess. Mary is not modeled after Asherah. Asherah was given uh, worship. Nobody but God alone, our triune God, is due worship. Worship is, is not due to creatures. And uh, idolatria, latria, was given, in, um, was given to uh, Asherah. So definitely not something that we recommend. Definitely something not part and parcel with the Catholic faith. Definitely something that should be condemned. But Mike Winger's problem is that Mike Winger goes too far in that because there was a condemnatory figure that was given the title of Queen of Heaven, that that then in turn means that that title should not be utilized for Mary. Here's the problem. There are titles that are misused and abused all over the place. Nebuchadnezzar was called Lord of Lords. And that doesn't mean that we should then in turn not call our Lord and Savior Christ the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. There are a number of titles that were misused and abused, utilized by dastardly figures. It doesn't then in turn mean that we shouldn't utilize them in the positive sense. And in the book of Revelation, Mary is presented as queen of heaven. There's a sign that appears in heaven. A woman clothed with a sun. But what is amazing about it? There's a crown on her head of 12 stars. There's a woman in the heavens presented as a queen. Now, notice the incredible language that's being utilized here. There's the dragon after her. She bore a male child. This child was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. We have a queenship, queenship imagery being utilized here. The woman, of course, a woman can only be Mary because the woman is the mother of the one that will rule with a rod of iron. That messianic uh, imagery presented in the Old Testament. I'm sure you all are very well aware of that. That one that would rule with a rod of iron is Christ. 
So we have this kind of imagery being portrayed by the book of Revelation. We also have throne language being utilized here. So this is very, very important here. All of this language being utilized here, this throne kind of language, this crown on this woman who is in the heavens, all of this is very, very important kind of imagery. Because this woman, as viewed by the early church, clearly referencing um, our Immaculate Mother Mary, this is very important because this is queenship imagery. That's massively important. So it is biblical. So we can point to a woman that is presented as a queen. Where? In heaven. In heavens. The literal Greek word is oranos. So we can point to a woman in the positive sense, in heaven, uh, uh, portrayed as a queen. I mean, it's magnificent, the kind of imagery that we're presented here in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. So to then be told that because there is a negative figure portrayed as queen of heaven in the Old Testament, that we cannot have a positive figure is ludicrous because it would make no sense at all. Because remember, there are titles that were used and abused in the Old Testament by tyrants particularly the title utilized by Nebuchadnezzar. Does that then mean that our Lord and Savior could not utilize these titles in the positive sense? We've got to be serious with our theology. And Mike Winger is not serious at all. Doing the intercession through the picture of Mary is killed for it. <laughs> this is not good typology. Right? This is not consistent biblical typology. I, I say, please compare it to what I've given you the last 14 weeks. You know, um, this is not good at all because if we were to follow that kind of logic, the terrible things done by tyrants in the Old Testament, we would then say, well, that we, that's horrible. What a horrible title being utilized by our Lord and Savior. What a horrific title being utilized there because that title was utilized for somebody that would do horrific crimes, that would commit dastardly crimes, that would murder people. He was a tyrant. He was an evil leader. He was a bad person. So how on earth can our Lord and Savior utilize that title? We have got, we have got to be serious. And this is not serious theology is not good biblical typology. Han acts like this is an office that was established that was healthy and good. The text seems to indicate that her, her intercession was rejected, it was manipulative, and it was the wrong way of doing things. <clears throat> no. The result, all you have to do is read, read the whole passage, right? He misquoted Genesis 3.15. He misapplies this passage right here. He just seems to consistently, he takes John and does all kinds of weird gymnastics with John 1 and 2 to try to say it's a seven-day creation motif and all this stuff. Just read the passage and you'll be safe. You will be safe. There's more on the Queen Mother. Uh, I, actually, I do have a little bit of time because I gave myself extra time today. So. I'm going to try and, uh, let's see, if I am correct... This is going to be one of them. I wrote the note down. Who is the? Yeah, it is. It is Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as King of Kings. Very interesting. So amazing. Uh, where is the other one? Let me see. Daniel two forty or thirty thirty eight. Give me one second. We'll see more examples. King of Kings right here. Amazing. So this is incredible. King of Kings utilized here. So this is not, there is another one. Ezra 7, I think. Verse 10 or 12. I'm, let me see. Yep. Artaxerxes, King of Kings. Uh, I guess I confused them. I was thinking of Lord of Lords. So it is King of Kings. And now if somebody is watching. I, I don't know why I thought the title Lord of Lords was utilized for uh, 
Nebuchadnezzar, but a king of kings. Okay, either which way. The same point uh, remains either which way. So either which way, Mike Winger's uh, terrible theology uh, crumbles apart. <laughs> um, let me give you another passage on the Queen Mother because he really, and a lot of Catholic apologists do this, they milk this Queen Mother concept because the Queen Mother was a big deal in the in the back in the day, right? Because you had a, a king who potentially had multiple wives and whichever one of them would end up you know, having the son who became king, that was when she became the Queen Mother, right? You weren't the Queen Mother. Yeah, that is a good point. I see somebody in the crowd uh, saying uh, others are called sons of, uh, sons of God. Yeah, you're right. There, there are many examples. Mike Winger's theology is just atrocious. Until your son became king, because it could have been any of those women who had the son who became king. So then you become the queen mother. And their statement is, you know, the queen mother is this institution. It's just part of reality. It's just, it's this good thing. But there's plenty of examples of bad queen mothers and more bad than good in the scriptures. There could be a hundred examples of bad queen mothers. And it wouldn't make any difference because the book of Revelation presents Mary as that good queen mother, the one who is the mother of our Lord and Savior, the mother of the one that would rule with a rod of iron. We only need one positive example. It doesn't matter if you read a thousand negative examples. Since 1 Kings 15, 13, um, here started worshiping this thing. This is not biblical. It's not true. And the violence they do to the scriptures to justify it is, is bad. Now, other Catholics will say, I don't care if it's in the Bible. We just trust the church. And I just say, at least you're being honest. <laughs> like, at least you're being honest about that. If any Catholic were to argue that their theology is not biblical based, that you cannot find any kernel of truth to their theology in the Bible, then they are a deluded Catholic, unfortunately. I do care if it's in the Bible and have no reason to trust the church over the scriptures on those issues. Other queen mothers I could give you examples of, like one you may have heard of named Jezebel. Probably the most famous queen mother example in the scriptures. Um, Athaliah, who kills her royal family and steals the throne, till Jehoiada, the good guy, uh, has her killed and puts Joash in the rightful place. And so we have another queen mother here who tries to usurp the throne of her of uh, the actual rightful king. So these are not the best examples, in all honesty. Now, did Mary have special authority in Jesus's ministry? Did he have? Did she have this intercessory role in Jesus's ministry? Well, in Luke eight nineteen, we have Mary coming and petitioning Jesus for something she wants. It says, then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. So he knows my mom's out there. She wants to see me. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Meaning that the motherly role that Mary had does not extend into the church in some sort of, you know, spiritual authority position, right? It's a beautiful thing. Like, I love my mom. And my mom doesn't have special rights at the church to like command things and act. keep in mind that very passage that he's quoting. We're going to deal with it right now. It's just, it just doesn't apply. That's the thing. So this is how uh, catholic.com, which is the Catholic answers website. Here's how they summarize the queen mother typology in their article called is Mary's queenship biblical. Let me read a quote to you. Understanding Mary as Queen Mother sheds light on her important intercessory role in the Christian life. Just like the Queen Mother of the Davidic Kingdom, Mary serves as advocate for the people in the Kingdom of God today. Thus, we should... In fact, as we round off, I'm going to let him ramble to the end and will refute any other garbage left over from this uh, pathetic presentation should approach our queen mother with confidence knowing that she carries our petitions with her, to her royal son and that she and that he responds to her as solomon did to bathsheba i will never refuse you of course right after that what did solomon do he refused her and killed the guy who made the request this is abuse this is just just hard just full-on abuse and it happens not only in 
I use Catholicism because it's just such a pervasive example. I was just looking for examples of this stuff, but it's used in Islam. They look for types of Muhammad. It's used in Mormonism. They look for types of Joseph Smith. It's used in the, the mother God cult. I've covered a couple of times, at least online, um, where they go, well, well, Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders and on Song Hong was rejected by the religious leaders. And I'm like, that's not a typology thing, man. Like you're just making stuff up. So I would, it would be irresponsible if I didn't do this teaching to guard us against this sort of abuse. For instance, how many Old Testament types of Jesus are specifically and clearly identified in the New Testament? Like, I don't even have the number. I wonder what the number really is. But let me give you some examples. The bronze serpent, Jesus identified that, right? Jonah, Jesus identified that. The scripture in the New Testament clearly identifies a prophet unto Mo or excuse me, a prophet like Moses, that Jesus is that prophet like Moses, that he's the tabernacle. I think that's not as clear, but I think that it's strong in there. And I shared that last week. Um, he's like Aaron, the high priest, read the book of Hebrews. He's like Melchizedek, the Melchizedekian priesthood. Um, he's like the rejected prophets from before in uh, both in the parables Jesus told, but also in Acts 7 and Stephen's address, where he relates all these different rejected guys to Jesus. Um, as the ultimate one. He's called the new Adam. He's the word through whom creation comes in John 1. He is the true manna. He is the rock that was struck. He is the Passover lamp. These are all specific, clear identifications. How many clear identifications are there of Mary as, an, as a type in the Old Testament? Zero. I don't, now it doesn't bother me if they're there. I, I just want to be faithful to the text, right? I was faithful to the word of God. There's just none that I know of. And if they're there, if they are there, they don't give us new theology. You just look for a picture of what the New Testament has revealed. You're not creating new teachings. So the problem is, in this Catholic apologetic, and along with others who try to twist the Bible to try to pretend it teaches things that they believe that it just doesn't teach, they don't start with clear teachings, right? They don't use any New Testament identifications of types, and they conclude with new theology that never existed in the text in the first place. This is what cults do. This is what uh, Islam does. This is what Mormonism does as they try to, you know, when you look at the text and you say, I want to believe the Bible, but the stuff my, my people teach, I can't find it in there. Well, the last resort is to find a picture of it. And then you can say, well, it's not clearly taught, but it's implied. And you might say, well, Mike, isn't that the Trinity? Isn't it not clearly taught, but implied? No, it is clearly taught. That's the whole point. The Bible forces you into this doctrine. That's, that's the whole point is that it's clearly taught. If it was not clearly taught, then we should not hold it, hold to it. You know, we should, if, if nothing else, just leave, leave the space blank you know? <laughs> as an, I don't know what it is. Um, so one rule will save you from all of this. And that is old Testament types do not establish new unbiblical theology. You just can't get new theology from old Testament types. There's, you know, there's one more clip. I don't know if Kirk, if you can still bring it up. There's one more clip I wanted to play for you guys. I just forgot about it, but this clip, um, this, this clip is going to show you how extreme the conclusions of all these things. Once you bring in these dogmas of Mary, these four Mary, you cannot have Jesus as King. If you won't have Mary as queen, this is the gospel of the new covenant. This is what we find when we read the whole Bible, not just in proof texts, but in typology. <laughs> this is why it matters. That's why it matters. That is nothing short of a false gospel. Nothing short of it. And it was used through finding vague, illegitimate pictures. And then at the end, he can go, when I was a uh, an anti-Catholic, ignorant Protestant. I thought I knew the Bible, but I didn't know about the pictures of Mary. And now I know the full gospel because I know the whole Bible and this nonsense. Um, it's, it's just offensive. There's a lot more I could cover. Um, there's a lot of other sort of... We're done. Well, we're done hearing him. We're going to shred the final four arguments that Poor Mike Winger is utilizing number one. This is a real typical argument you frequently hear. I don't know why, why they continue to utilize this really embarrassing argument. The one of the, of, uh, in Luke, of the hearing of the word of God, 
as if Mary is being denigrated. This is ridiculous. Look at Luke 1. Let's look at Luke 1. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, and I'm going to read it properly, Rejoice, or hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know man? The angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And now, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the mate servant of the Lord, let it be done. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Are you telling me that Mary wasn't the one who first heard that word, who first gave her assent to that word, who said, let it be done unto me according to your word? And you want us to believe that Mary is being denigrated later in the very same gospel where we're told she was the very first one who heard, who kept that word and vouchsafed that word in her heart, as the great St. Augustine tells us? Really? You got to be kidding me. Because this is the kind of theology Mike Winger wants you to believe. He wants you to believe the very same author of the Gospel of Luke contradicts himself later in the Gospel. The fact of the matter is that it's true. Anyone that hears the Word of God, anyone is part of the family of God. That was the message of our Lord and Savior. He never once denigrated his mother ever. The message was clear. Those that hear the Word of God and keep the word of God are part of the familial kingdom of God. And Mary was the very first one who heard that word. We're told that in Luke 1. But Mike Winger would have you believe that our Lord and Savior was, meh, who cares about my mother? There is no special role for her. That is very dangerous theology. Very dangerous theology. That's point number one shredded point number two islam and mormonism do this very thing we're told there's a very big problem there within the false religions of islam and mormonism you don't have people that are the disciples of the apostles that were taught and trained in an unbroken chain that goes right to the head christ you don't have them teaching these kinds of things that would support Islam or Mormonism. You don't have the multiple deities garbage taught by the anti-Nicene fathers. You don't have the trash taught within Islam of the supposed references to the paraclete as Muhammad taught in any of the early fathers of them talking about any future prophet. No, they recognize the paracletos, the paraclete is the Holy Ghost. You don't have ancient support for Islam or Mormonism. But here's, here's a tough thing for you, Mike Winger. We can very easily put Protestantism right there with Islam and Mormonism when it comes to teachings like sola fide, sola scriptura, or any of these modern-day novelties that arose around the time of Luther. Some arose later. 
the denial of the perpetual virginity of Mary. You couldn't find that in any of the early fathers. You didn't find that in any of the early reformers either. You didn't find that in Calvin, in Zwingli, in Francis Turretin, in Martin Luther. Here's the problem for you, Mike Winger. Your theological novelties have no, no place in the early church, just like Islam, just like Mormonism. But everything you brought up today, Mary as Teotokos, mother of God, Mary as all immaculate, Mary as queen of heaven, the dormition and the bodily assumption and the perpetual virginity of Mary. A ton of early support for that. That, now that should keep you up late at night, Mike. No argument. We agree about the Old Testament types of Christ in the Old Testament. But where we do differ and where we will conclude our show tonight, and I hope you all have been edified. I'm sorry for such a late show. How many people do we have watching? Probably had a very poor audience because uh, I've never done a show so late before. Um, sorry about the incredibly late time. But we were told that there are clear pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. And there are none of Mary, we're told. There are no ancient pictures of Mary, we're told. Yet in Genesis 3, Mary is clearly that woman who would be at complete enmity with the devil. The early fathers saw it. The Bible clearly makes that connection. In the book of Revelation. Mary is there. Predestined. Before she was ever even created. To never be in the clutches of the devil. Mary is a figure of Judith. Who... We read of the heroine Judith, even the great biblicist, St. Jerome, recognized that connection with the biblical language being utilized there. Go watch a show I did with Dr. Hahn over the Apocrypha Apocalypse for that. Mary is presented as a new, the, new daughter, the new daughter of Jephthah. Now, we recognize the negative implications of Jephthah's daughter in the Old Testament. But with Mary, there is no darkness. There is rather life and light. And whereas the perpetual virginity of one woman in the Old Testament led to darkness, the perpetual virginity of the new, of this new figure, of this all immaculate Mother Mary, is a positive one. It's one where there is elation, there is joy, there is happiness, and there is love. Mary is a clear figure of that by the exact usage of the Greek in the book of Judges being utilized for Mary. There's no doubt there. The early fathers recognized that as well. And last but not least, and there are more, but last but not least, Mary is that new ark of the new covenant. The language being utilized referencing the ark of the Old Testament, utilized for Mary. Particularly Greek terms utilized in ark imagery exclusively utilized in arch imagery particularly greek terms that a good jewish individual would have recognized utilized in the presence of mary as mary is recognized as that new ark of the new covenant you you recognize all of this important theology about mary when you actually do your homework and you read the bible the way an early Christian would have, with early Christian lenses, the way the early church fathers read the Bible. And before we do conclude today, I, I do want to announce a very special show that I have coming up next week. God willing, we'll be doing it on my brother Sam's channel. God willing, I'm not sure, we're not sure what day next week yet. But I am not aware of any show or any article or anything ever written before on the topic. But I am, hopefully, God willing, I'll be wrapping it up tomorrow. Actually, no, probably, probably Monday I'll wrap it up. Where I am doing a major in-depth research and study 
on the most ancient Marian prayers, the intercession of Mary through prayer in the early church fathers, from the very earliest period of church history, all the way to the medieval era. I need your prayers so that I can be able to finish that as I am working on it. And that no doubt will also be incorporated into our volume two on Mariology. Pray for that project as well. And if you have not gotten our first book on Mary, you can find it. If you want to get it, in, I know a lot of people don't want to buy off Amazon. You can find it available on EWTN. And it is 2.30 a.m. for me. It might be later for you, depending on where you are in the world. I hope you were edified. There are more. There are more sessions that I have planned. God willing, to maybe tomorrow, or I'm not, by the way, I will be going live with Sam Saturday. Tomorrow he'll be traveling. We won't be able to go live tomorrow. But in a day or two or three, I will also be refuting Mike Winger on the Holy Eucharist. Pray for me. And I'll be praying for you. And I had a great time with you this evening. I would not have rather, I would not have spent an evening any other way. I enjoyed pulling up my uh, my coffee for one period, my Diet Coke for the other, and uh, and going through the whole video of Mike Winger. And I pray that you were edified. Pray for me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.